On today's show, the Atlanta Hawks began their in-season tournament journey on Tuesday evening, and it did so with a road win in Detroit. We'll cover all of what transpired and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1588 of the Lothon Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Tuesday evening into Wednesday. And I encourage you at the top of the podcast, as I always do, to make us your first listen each and every day. Check us out anywhere you get your podcasts, places like Apple and Spotify, as well as YouTube on the video side. Already, this is our third show this week and much more to come. But on today's show, we'll dive straight in now to what became a 126 to 120 victory for the Hawks on the road in Detroit. I am in Detroit right now. I was in the building for this game this evening and a lot of stuff to talk about on this particular evening. Of course, it was the in-season tournament opener for the Hawks and they are now 1-0 in that event. A nice bounce back win after a disappointing loss over the weekend to the Miami Heat. And uh, the headliner in some ways that Trey Young did not play in this contest. Now that was not totally out of the blue on Tuesday. Trey announced along with his wife Shelby that they had their second child on Monday. So congratulations to them. Uh, big news there. Covered that a little bit on yesterday's podcast where we kind of previewed the game on Tuesday, but there was some doubt as to whether Trey would play or not. He did not come to Detroit, and the Hawks were able to overcome that absence and win this game anyway. Atlanta did actually play fairly well for large portions of this game, I would say. They are up by 12 points in the first half at one point in time. That did not maintain. In fact, the Pistons led this game by five points in the second half at one point. It got pretty dicey. It was never comfortable for the Hawks at any point in the second half, to be honest with you. But finally, they were able to make enough plays defensively, enough big shots offensively, and they were able to kind of escape with a win by six points. Appropriately, our friends at FanDuel made this game about minus four or five, four and a half or five. So this is basically right exactly where the projection was for FanDuel in this game as the Hawks were favored, even without Trey. And that's certainly the, for me anyway, the right tact. Yes, the Hawks are still better than the Pistons, in my view, without Trey Young. Now, are the Hawks better without Trey Young? No. In fact, I find the discussion very silly, and it's been happening in some some circles. I won't say that it's, it's broadly out there, but um, some some corners of the internet in which there's this discussion happening about whether the Hawks are better without Trey or not. Um, I'll just say this as the short version: No, they are not. But in this game, they did play well on offense, which was certainly where I want to start because it's, it, was, it was the more positive end of the floor in this contest. But when you adjust for being without Trey Young, who is one of the best offensive engines in the entire NBA, for the Hawks to go on the road and against a team that's not great defensively, but they're not awful defensively in Detroit, and the Hawks had a 124 offensive rating in this game. That is a very, very good number. They shot it well from the floor, 52%. They got to the line 26 times, made 24 of them. That is a very notable development because you know even a guy like Clint Capella made both his free throws in this game. Only two misses all night for Atlanta. Um, that's a decent number of attempts and very, very good efficiency, especially on a, on a game where Detroit actually missed seven free throws. That's the difference in the game in a lot of ways. Um, they didn't blow anybody away from three-point range. They were 12 of 33. That isn't a ton of attempts, but it's solid enough. It is telling to me that the Hawks only created four corner threes in the entire game. That's an area where Trey was certainly missed. You know, DeJounte is very good at a lot of things. He's not the passer nor the facilitator of Trey. And I think that corner threes is a good thing to kind of circle sometimes with, with regard to who creates shots for you. And they missed Trey's gravity there. But the Hawks were good enough on offense, certainly on the whole, but even in most areas down, up and down the line. They had 27 assists in this game. They had 14 turnovers. That's not a great number, but it's totally fine. It got a little bit shaky at times, ball security-wise, but it was good enough on the whole. The one area where they weren't great was on the opposite glass because Detroit's biggest strength, as I talked about a little bit on yesterday's show, is that Detroit is a very good rebounding team. They play pretty big. They're athletic, etc. But the Hawks were effective in transition in this game. They had 17 fast break points, and they were elite when it came to efficiency in transition opportunities. They made the most of those chances. Uh, DeJounte was the clear centerpiece of the offense, as you would expect without Trey Young. Large usage, usage for him. And just finally so. Like, look, we'll talk more about DeJounte later on in the podcast, but this is one of the reasons why you have DeJounte Murray, is that if Trey Young misses a game or misses a half or whatever, you have a guy who can create that usage and go out and have 32 points and nine, and nine assists and play efficiently and, and carry the load. Like, he's not the same quality, I don't think, as Trey offensively in a vacuum. But DeJounte is more than capable of being the number one option for a night like this. And as longtime Hawks fans might remember, 
The Hawks just had no one that could do what DeJounte did tonight until they got DeJounte for several years. So it's nice to have that kind of guy to kind of throw the ball to and say, all right, it's your team in a lot of ways. But even beyond that, the Hawks had five guys with 16 points or more. They weren't like thoroughly unbalanced in this game either. So a lot of positives on offense. They did they didn't they did not get to the rim very much or actually make a lot of shots at the rim in this game. But on a night when they actually needed to make some mid-range shots, they were able to do that. Now, DeJounte wasn't the only one. You know, Bogey made a couple, uh, Hunter made a couple, Jalen you know, Johnson made a couple, et cetera. They made some shots and uh, they were effective enough on offense. And again, on the whole, especially when you adjust for not having Trey, a very good offensive performance from the Hawks in, in Detroit. Now, defensively, I have to say it was not fantastic. <laughs> uh, the Pistons are a very poor, in my view, offensive team. They don't have a lot of spacing at all, especially their starting lineup. Um, that's it, Ramp, and I'll say for another day for the most part, but I do not understand the theory of the case on that lineup at all for Detroit. But anyway, they ended up with a 118 offensive rating, and that is really not good for the Hawks, honestly. You know, big picture, there were some areas where they were okay in this game, but they allowed 70, yes, 70 points in the paint. That is way too many, and DeJounte acknowledges after the game as well. A lot of it was um, putting the bigs in bad positions. You know, uh, Clint and Onyeka had five fouls each. A lot of that was because the point of attack wasn't the best at different times. And for me, the weakness of the defense in this game was actually the forward spots, which is not usually a weakness for the Hawks on, on defense on the whole, but I thought a couple of guys were kind of struggling there, off the ball, et cetera. Detroit had 61% shooting from two-point range in this game. That is a very, very good number and a bad number for the Hawks. Um, the Pistons' best characteristic on offense is their offensive rebounding. As I mentioned before, the Hawks did okay there. Now, they weren't good on the glass defensively, but they did not get bludgeoned, which I thought was very important because of the way that Detroit plays. So that's one area of a positivity. Um, and they also did a pretty good job getting back in transition at times. I thought the perimeter stuff was not fantastic and lots of, you know, lots of back cuts and attention stuff that was not great off the ball for the Hawks in this game. But look, they made, they made enough stops down the stretch. They held the Pistons in check in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, I, I have to say this, if Detroit had shot the ball better from three-point range, the Hawks might have been in some trouble, to be honest with you. But part of that is that Detroit isn't a good shooting team. So the Hawks play that a little bit differently than you might expect. Uh, you know, Cade, they did a good job on him all night long. He was very much contained by, you know, DeJounte and Hunter and even a little bit of Jalen Johnson sprinkling in there as well. And uh, on the whole, the Hawks did a good job um, when it mattered. Now, were they good off? Sorry, were they good defensively in this game? They were not, but they made enough plays. Uh, the old Glenn Willis adage of playing just enough defense and they'll kind of do that in this game. And uh, you would think that without Trey, the theory of the case is that it used to be a lot without uh, before before DeJounte was that when Trey didn't play, they would slow the game way down and muck it up and play good defense. In this game, it's kind of funny. They, they were actually kind of what they usually are. They were really good offensively and not that good defensively. So anyway, we'll have more on that when it comes to context. And uh, the rest of the team was available for the Hawks other than Trey, other than the rookies who are out right now, Bufkin and Gay. It's worth at least noting that Detroit was without some key guys, um, Boyan Madonovich, Jalen Duran, et cetera. They actually had the more banged up team. Obviously, Trey is the biggest name and the best player that missed this game. But uh, anyway, long story short, part of the appeal here, and I even asked Sadiq Bay about this after the game as well, was that in-season tournament began for the Hawks. They waited a long time to have it start. And as I sort of teased on the show last night, on Monday evening into Tuesday, the Hawks kind of needed this game. Like, if, if they care about the tournament, which is certainly up for debate for a lot of teams, if they want to win the tournament and, and qualify for, for the quarterfinals, et cetera, this is the easiest game in their group play on the road in Detroit. And yes, without Trey, the, the task was more difficult, but they had to get this one, um, and they went out and did it. So all that said, that's kind of the broad takeaway from, from today's game. We'll have more on the game flow, how this one kind of unfolded throughout the game. And at the end of the podcast, as we always do, a look at all of the players and how they performed in this spot. But first, before we get to all of that, we work more sponsors on today's podcast. Today's show is sponsored by eBay Motors, and our partners at eBay Motors have been teaming up with Locked On Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd to bring you some of the best fantasy basketball picks each week all season long. Whether you are prepping for a daily draft or scouting the waiver wire, every single week we're going to be providing you with some players that are guaranteed to fit on your fantasy basketball roster. So let's see now who Josh has picked out for us on this week's edition of eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. Josh, of course, has a list of guys to highlight, but the one that I want to circle and focus on on, the, on today's podcast is actually an old friend, Hawks legend, and now Blazers guard, Skylar Mays. Josh points out that Skylar Mays has been starting and has been starting and will be starting for a while longer for the Blazers for a little while, at least with all the injuries that they have in Portland. And his value right now is really, really appealing for fantasy teams, especially until Malcolm Brogdon comes back or whatever's going to happen there. 
Skyler just had back-to-back double doubles in Portland. He just signed a deal that is a full contract after being on a two-way in Portland. So congratulations to him on that. But um, you know, basketball-wise, lots of points, lots of assists. It gives him the, the opportunity to actually check a lot of boxes on the stat sheet: uh, scoring assists, steals, threes, etc. He's a fantastic example of someone who's actually the, uh, the diehard fantasy players already probably have on their radar, but uh, a good way to find an edge right now as someone who came from totally off the radar to you know starting and playing 30 plus minutes in the middle of the season Mays is a guy that i think is a big value and josh seems to agree given all the injuries and all that stuff in portland and by the way again josh lloyd from left fantasy basketball is going to help you with winning your fantasy championship all year long ebay motors though those those championship team is all about the way that each single player is a perfect fit for that team it's the same by the way for your vehicle i'm on the road a lot for work. In fact, right now I'm on the road in Detroit and going to Hawks games all over the place. And there have been some times where I need to find upgrades for my car, even just to fix a part or two to keep things running. eBay Motors is the best possible place to do all of that. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride, you can make sure that your truck or car stays running smoothly. They have brake kits and LED lights and roof racks, bumpers, whatever your vehicle happens to need, eBay Motors will have it and they have it right now. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's also guaranteed to fit your ride the first time every time or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not burning cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. That is ebaymotors.com. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, we'll dive in now to what transpired in this game. And uh, it was Bogey in place of Trey. And not a huge surprise there. He kind of was up and down in this one, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on. But he gives them a lot of offensive push. And I thought that was probably useful in the absence of Trey. And he was kind of the natural guy to start in this game. Ended up playing, by the way, 34 minutes. That's a season high for Bogey um, tonight. Um, DeJounte got the first crack at Cade defensively. And basically, Pistons play Cade at point guard. So that was kind of part of their theory there. The Hawks actually opened this game 14-6. to They made their first seven shots, including five of them in the paint. The Hawks actually played 10 guys in the first quarter, which does not usually happen. Now, there's a slight asterisk to that because... Um, it was Bay and Kongwu as usual as the first subs, but they also had AJ Griffin come in alongside with them. So that was kind of what you would expect in some ways to have AJ kind of be the eighth man on a night when, without Trey. Then it was also Trent Forrest as the backup point guard, um, not Patty Mills. Now I talked about this at length yesterday on the show. I recommend listening to that podcast. I won't go all, on a full um, detailed breakdown now, but it is one game. It is a data point of one, but um, for now, I think that you can kind of assume that that Patty Mills is not going to be like in the mix playing a ton. Now we'll see moving forward. But this is a, a a circle night that they could have used Patty, and they went to Trent Forrest instead. Keep that in mind. Anyway, um, AJ Griffin, who was the eighth guy, played in the first half, but then actually tweaked his ankle. And the Hawks actually said he had a, he had a right ankle sprain. He ended, up, he ended up coming back in the game, but he was certainly hopping around on that ankle. They went to Garrison Matthews for about two minutes. I think. In fact, I'm pretty confident it was only because AJ got hurt um, because Garrison never came back. He only played one two-minute stint. Made his only shot, which was nice to see. But anyway, the Hawks dropped by 12 mid-quarter in the first half. Um, the Pistons, again, that starting lineup just doesn't make any sense. But DeJounte had it going early on, 17, sorry, 11 points on his first seven shots in the first eight minutes. Detroit, though, came back and uh, was certainly um, – I'll say resilient in this game. The Hawks, though, were awesome on offense in the first quarter. They actually had a 152 offensive rating to go up by nine at the end of the first. Um, but Detroit was not uh, necessarily afraid, and they were not going to fade away. So the theory for me in this game was that the Hawks kind of just needed to hold the line when, the, when DeJounte left the court. And in the end, they were minus three without DeJounte. That is more than good enough on a night when they kind of just had to get through, you know, 10, 12 minutes without DeJounte. They were able to do that effectively enough and that included Trent Force at the point but there was a run by the Pistons mid-second quarter a 13 to 3 push the offense kind of stalled out that was kind of probably the worst stretch of the offense all night long was about a five six minute stretch in the second quarter Murray kind of stalled a little bit Jalen had a bad rep against Azar Thompson where he got blocked at the rim Hunter got, Hunter got stripped a couple times as well by Killian Hayes at least once the Hawks had 14 points in about nine and a half minutes, so that's not a good, not a good run there at all. They did wake up later on in the in the uh, second quarter, but defensively, it was really the whole time. It was fouls. It was just you know over over aggression. It was not being attentive off the ball, etc. It did stabilize late in the half. Bogey and Dejounte kind of took the game over at the end of the first half. They scored the last 14 points of the half for the Hawks. Bogey had a couple of uh, a couple of threes that were pretty big shots, and then Murray got a star Thompson on a step back jumper late in the first half as well. And the Hawks were by three at halftime. Um, the Hawks, though, were truly bad out of the locker room in the third quarter. So they came out and allowed the Pistons to go on a 15-6 to run to put the Hawks down by 
I believe, five in the middle of the third quarter. Now, that is not where you want to be on the road against a team that you're better than. Um, defensively, it was pretty rough. A couple of breakdowns in transition during that, during that time. At one, at one point, nobody stopped the ball in transition, and they, and they left Capella out to dry trying to contest a Asar Thompson dunk, and that ended up being a Sports Center highlight from Asar, a massive dunk. And by the way, though, Quinn was furious. You don't often see him storming out the way that he did on that timeout. Not at Clint. It was about everybody else, basically not picking up the ball, et cetera. And uh, the Hawks were also off on offense at that point in time, too. But fortunately, they were pretty good after that. Rotation was all the same other than A.J. coming back and no Garrison in the second half. But they did figure things out in the, in the middle of the quarter, a 19-8 to overall run. Murray found his game, had 11 points in a short period of time. Hunter and Bay vastly, and I mean vastly improved, half to half, first half to second half, uh, especially those two guys I thought were uh, night and day better. Um, Bay in particular woke up a lot in the third quarter. The Hawks didn't shoot it great in the third quarter. They only had uh, two turnovers and six offensive rebounds. That was a big period of time. And then the fourth quarter, the Hawks, you know, kind of stalled out again a little bit with Sol to come back. They actually led bet- by between five points and nine points for like five and a half minutes. And then the Pistons, to their credit, just kept coming. They played um, – actually, Onyeka got his fifth foul. He had played 11 minutes in a row. Both guys, Onyeka and Clint, had five fouls each. They played like 14 straight minutes in the second half. They were uh, leaning on that group a lot. But the Pistons had a couple of opportunities to take the lead mid-quarter. In fact, there was a big swing that I'm still going to circle now, despite the game being pretty close late, on, late where the Pistons were down one with five and a half minutes to go. And Killian Hayes had, I mean, I'm not kidding you, a wide open three for the lead for Detroit, and he missed it. And then within 10 seconds, Bay hit a three, and that gave the Hawks a four-point lead instead of a two-point deficit. That was a big swing. Now, it was not over there, obviously. Um, out of a timeout with four minutes to go, the Hawks dropped by four points. Um, you know, DeJounte misses a, a pretty good look. They trade points. Bogey misses a pretty good look. And suddenly, the game is very, very, very close again. Um, there was a great setup, I thought. Um, I will say, the Pistons took the lead with two minutes to go after a Murray miss and a run-up dunk. But a huge, huge, huge shot from Hunter. Actually had a pretty friendly roll on a jump shot. And then Murray gets, to the, gets into the paint, sets up Capella, Beautifully for a dunk. Clint goes up strong and dunks it in an aggressive fashion. Put the Hawks up by three points with about a minute to go. And the Hawks were in control at that point in time. Now, I thought it was interesting because the Hawks went to Bay defensively in place of Bogey. Now, neither of those guys is a great option, obviously. I mean, I think if it was later in the game, maybe you would have seen Trent Forrest just for defense only. But because they wanted to play in the flow of things, they probably don't want to go with Trent, Trent on offense. So they went a little bit bigger with Bay. Made sense to me. He had been playing well in the second half, et cetera. Uh, old friend Kevin Knox, playing for the Pistons these days, missed a three for the tie with about a half minute to go. And then Murray made free throws to go by five. It was probably over then, except for the fact that it was almost, and I mean almost, a four-point play for Alec Burks with about 30 seconds to go. Murray fouled him kind of intentionally because they had a foul to give. And Burks got creative, tried to shoot through it. It was correctly called a non-shooting foul, but it was way too close for comfort. I'll say that. Um, and the Detroit crowd did not like that overturn, or it's maybe not not even overturn the way that was called. Anyway, that was the only time it was like kind of dicey in the final minute. You know, the Hawks got that break; they got to stop there. And then I have to say, Jalen Johnson made a jump shot. And if you see the the box score, it's like, oh, he made a jump shot, nice. That was about as silly of a shot as you will ever see. Now, it didn't matter. And by the way, he made it, which made it a little bit easier to take. Um, but it wouldn't have mattered if it was Trey or DeJounte. It wasn't a Jalen skill thing. Um, they were up five with the ball and like 20 seconds to go. And he took like a pull-up 17-foot jump shot. And I, I have no idea why. Early shot clock, like all you got to do there is either get fouled or just dribble the ball out. I don't know why he shot that shot. It was it was kind of hilariously bad from Jalen. I'm not really sure what happened. He, he, he didn't talk to the media after the game. Um, so that was, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter, <laughs> but it was just like, whoa, what are you doing? But he made it. That helped. And uh, the game was over from that point forward, honestly. So I say all that. It was not in control for the Hawks this whole game. I mean, they certainly had to battle and scratch and claw. They were down multiple times. They had big runs. They had big they had big uh, sort of I don't know, deficits, et cetera. Um, but they were resilient. I mean, they, they kept coming. This is a game that a, a lot of times in the last couple of years, the Hawks might have lost. And it would have been a bad loss at the time. You know, Saturday's game against the Pistons, sorry, against the Heat, was a bad loss at home, and I think they all probably took that took that to heart. They were not necessarily uh, thrilled with that result. Um, I talked to Sadiq after the game; like they, they seem to be caring about the season tournament. The the quality of play is pretty good in this game. I, Quinn talked about that too. Both teams playing with intensity, kind of like playoff level intensity in this spot. But in the end, 
the better team won. The Hawks are better than the Pistons, but they had to execute, doing it, doing it without Trey. Had to DeJounte. Obviously, we'll talk about him more in a second. But, yeah, certainly a complete performance in some ways. Great offense for the most part. And defense, but alas, they get enough and escape with the victory. All right, we'll have windfall segment coming up. We'll talk about the uh, player-by-player player of evaluations in this game and talk about all 10 guys who appeared for Atlanta. But first, they work more sponsors on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by Ibotta and Big Holly's. Me, big family get-togethers. You don't have to spend all that money on the, on the Thanksgiving spread without getting something back in return. And with Ibotta, you can get your turkey and all of your favorite sides for free. Starting November 1st, for the fourth year in a row, Ibotta is giving 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving feast. Just add the offers in the app to redeem for everything that you possibly need to make your Thanksgiving feast complete. All you have to do is shop at your favorite retailers or and upload your receipt from there. Ibotta will give you cash back on hundreds of grocery items for produce, personal care, to pantry goods. You can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you happen to be purchasing. Other apps might give you points that don't amount to much, but with Ibotta, you get real cash back. You can cash that out to your bank account, to, pay to PayPal, or to gift cards. You can also get cash back on hundreds of different online brands and retailers, too. When you use Ibotta right now, that includes places like Lowe's and Macy's and Sephora and Best Buy and more. Download the Ibotta app right now. Use promo code LOCKED to get 100% cash back. And the place to do that is, again, Ibotta in the app, 100% cash back. Use promo code LOCKED on Thanksgiving dinner starting November 1st. Go to the App Store, Google Play Store right now. Download the free Ibotta app and use the promo code LOCKED. That is I-B-O-T-T-A, the Google Play or App Store, and use promo code LOCKED. Check out Ibotta today. All right, and to the player evaluations at the end of today's podcast. Again, 10 guys appeared, although Garrison Matthews played two minutes. So not, not a ton to add there. He, he did make his confident Catch and shoot three. That's what he's out there to do. He had a rebound. I thought he did his job beautifully. He was plus five. Shouts to Garrison Matthews. Uh, AJ played eight minutes. I think he would have he played a little bit more than that, if not for the ankle, but I was glad he came back in. We will see if that costs him at all when it comes to Wednesday. You know, it's just an ankle sprain, but we don't know severity. But obviously, the, the fact that he came back in is a good sign. He made a three in this game, got to the line for free throws. Uh, defensively, it's still a little bit shaky for AJ at the very least, but he was all right. Uh, Trent Forrest, shouts to him. I am a big advocate of Trent Forrest. I always have been. Um, you know, stewardship offensively and defense at the point of attack. Two points, four assists for for Trent in 13 minutes. Minus three, totally fine. I am totally fine with him playing over Patty Mills. Now, uh, again, it's it's really a TBD on Patty. Uh, Quinn had positive things to say about Mills pregame. Um, in typical Quinn fashion, he was asked kind of about who might contribute and was asked about Patty in particular. He gave some positivity about Patty, as far as like being a great vet and the way that he helps the team and that he didn't play. So we'll see. I don't really know, but I think if I had to guess the next time that Trey or DeJounte are out, you'll probably see Trey Forrest and uh, maybe long-term Buff King will play some, but obviously he's hurt right now too. So anyway, if you want more on that subject, listen to yesterday's podcast where I talked about that for about five, six, seven minutes. Anyway, Forrest, good job from him off the bench. Uh, Anyeka, eight points, nine rebounds, two assists and a block. Did have five fouls. In 21 minutes, a couple of great post-up plays where he shows off his touch. He kind of bodied Asar Thompson at one point. That was good to see. Uh, you know, he wasn't perfect, but I thought Onyeka played well. Um, certainly gave him good good rim protection around the rim, and uh, his touch is great offensively for sure. Uh, Bay, it was truly uh, along with Hunter. These kind of group those guys together. Two bad first halves and two better second halves. In particular, in particular, Sadiq Bay. So he, had, he ended up with 19 points on uh, 16 shooting possessions, so not fantastic there. He was four of six on twos, two of seven on threes, got to the line six times, five rebounds, two assists, two steals, and a block for Sadiq, plus five off the bench. He actually led the team in scoring in the second half with 15 points. Uh, I thought he was a different player in the second half. Obviously, worth noting as well, this is actually his first time back to Detroit. Uh, and if you don't remember this from previous, Sadiq Bey was drafted by the Pistons, played there for three and a half years, and then traded to the Hawks last year at the deadline. So. Um, he had not played there ever in the visitors' locker room. Talked about that after the game. Didn't he, hadn't even ever been in the visitors' locker room in Detroit. So a homecoming for him in some ways. Uh, first half, he was just not good. Like he wasn't really dialed in. He was pretty passive. Maybe just had to find his footing. But he was good in the second half. Active. Maybe even like really. You know, I thought he was maybe if anything over aggressive at times. The second half. That, that, you certainly take that for the most part. If you're Bay, passing wise, not always the best. But um, he made some plays and played with physicality after halftime. To the starters. DeAndre Hunter, same kind of thing. First half, really rough. I thought, especially in the first half, I thought about all three forwards, really. Bay and Hunter in particular, but even Johnson was not great in the first half either. But 
Hunter kind of found it, had five assists in the game, 16 points, five rebounds, had a steal, and uh, not super efficient offensively. He was like basically a point, per, a, a point per shot or so, which is okay. Not great, but okay. And then defensively, he got better as the game went along, for sure. Uh, Jalen Johnson, kind of a weird night for him. 16 points, five rebounds, did have a steal and a block, and was efficient, actually. Um, uh, sorry, four of seven on twos, and made both of, his, both of his three, which is good to see. Defensively, a weird one for Jalen. When he was kind of dialed in, he made his usual plays. He's obviously super long, athletic, and instinctive, et cetera. But off the ball, I thought he was like really kind of napping and kind of being inattentive in a weird way. He still makes a lot of mistakes, uh, which is okay. Like he, he has the skill set to make up for some of those mistakes, which certainly helps. But I think he'll get better and better at that. Um, just a reminder that he's still pretty young when it comes to like playing real minutes. So uh, he had a couple of uh, some some brain issues in this one, I'll say, off the ball. But he still contributed well. A couple of nice flash plays. And then, of course, the hilarious jump shot at the end of the contest. Capella, eight points, seven rebounds, three blocks, two steals, and an assist. Um, five fouls, plus eight. He took four shots all night long. I believe they were all around the rim. He had one hilariously bad turnover in the first quarter where he kind of tried to run the fast break. I don't know why he did that. Um, kind of funny, like he, he'll have a play or two every night that make, make people kind of mad at him, and I get that. But the rest of the game, he was really good, I thought, anchoring at the back line. I thought he, 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 he and on Yeka, it's tough to say that, I guess. Um, they are really effective around the rim. Now, that was not their fault that they allowed so many points in the paint in this game. They did their job. It was kind of the perimeter stuff and some of the back cuts, et cetera. But I thought Clint was good, other than a couple of uh, you know mistakes that everybody kind of makes along the way. Uh, to the backcourt. Bogey, 17 points on 17 shots. So first half, he was hot, and him and DeJounte closed the first half out well. Second half, he was pretty cold, actually. He kind of cooled off, and they went away from him a little bit more, um, both because of minutes, I'm sure, but also because Bay was playing so well. But I think Bogey gave him that punch they kind of needed without Trey. Obviously, DeJounte took the larger load, but Bogey, again, a season high by like five minutes offensively. It wouldn't stun me if Bogey was like relatively limited on Wednesday. On a back-to-back after playing 34, 34 minutes. But I thought he was, uh, you know, as usual, the Hawks are good when he's good. And he was pretty good in this game. Um, and then DeJounte, awesome night across the board. 32 points, 10 assists, 5 rebounds, 3 steals. I believe they gave him an assist late because they actually had 9 late. And then, like, between the time the game ended and the time we were doing post game, he got a 10th a assist. I think even Trey tweeted about one that they kind of missed. Maybe they found that at some point in time, but I'm looking at the NBA basketball right now, and it says 32 and 10. So there you go. Double double for DeJounte. Uh, I thought he was great, honestly. A couple of times, I think in the third quarter, he kind of lulled a little bit, and he wasn't, like, incredibly efficient. 32 points on 26 shooting possessions is fine. It's not bad at all. Um, 10 assists is great. Two turnovers is really good. Defensively, uh, Quinn actually went out of his way to praise DeJounte and said, I actually asked about this. He talked about how DeJounte's defense, the point of attack, was kind of the biggest story for him. I wouldn't go that far. I think he was better offensively than defensively, defensively in this game. But I thought he did give them a lot there. And he's been better defensively, certainly, this year than he was last year. I was very critical of DeJounte's defense last year. I think I was right about that. But I think this year he's been much better, much more attentive. He kind of talked about that tonight as well. But, uh, yeah, this is, again, this is kind of why you have DeJounte Murray. He and Trey are not, like, perfect, perfect, perfect fits together. But one of the advantages of having DeJounte on your team is that if Trey misses time, you can, have, you can just hand him the keys. He played 37 minutes. And uh, was really good in this game. So if he doesn't play that well, they, they probably lose. And uh, that's just one you have to get on the agenda. And I think he was really, really good on tonight's game. So with all that said, a very nice win to begin the in tournament. And by the way, one more thing on the in tournament for now is that Indiana beat Philadelphia on the road tonight. So the Pacers are now leading the group at 2-0. Indiana, though, comes to Atlanta. So that was uh, a helpful result on paper for the Hawks would be Philadelphia losing at home. Um, obviously, Philly is the favorite in the group, at least betting wise. But now Indiana is 2-0 and they have to come to Atlanta. So if the Hawks are interested in winning the season tournament, they have a lot of work to do. You got you probably have to go at least 3-1 and one in your four group group games. But it would be kind of helpful to them if they don't, don't have to deal with Philly as much. And Indiana is a probably an easier matchup. Although, although Indiana is playing great offensively, but they're a little bit easier to deal with on the whole in Philadelphia, especially because the Pacers, again, come to Atlanta. So from here, both the Hawks and me have a quick turnaround in this spot. So I'm in Detroit. The Hawks, though, are flying, I believe, probably right now as we speak. Um, I don't have the luxury of a, pl- of a private plane back to Atlanta, but the Hawks do play on Wednesday. So if you listen to this podcast Wednesday morning or Wednesday afternoon, the Hawks play tonight at home against the Knicks. This is actually a rematch of a game that happened already this year in the same building. The Knicks came in to Atlanta and beat the Hawks in the second game of the season. So 
some, uh, let's just say, I don't know, revenge angle for the Hawks in this game. Also, the, the Knicks had the rest advantage. They already they did not play tonight. Um, Hawks have home court, of course, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, that'll be interesting. R.J. Barrett is questionable to play for New York. He's listed as questionable with a migraine in advance of Wednesday's game. TBD on the Hawks injury report, of course. I expect Trey to play after he uh, was out of the lineup today. Obviously, he did not come to Detroit, but he'll be back in Atlanta tomorrow, you would you would imagine. So there you go on that. And we'll see who else is available to play for the Hawks. But a nice test. Obviously, a back-to-back with travel is always tough, especially like not like down the street travel. Detroit's not too far away, but not a short trip either. So we'll see how the Hawks respond to all of that. But a big game, actually, against a conference opponent that, that is going to be probably in the mix for the Hawks playoff-wise. So circle that one on Wednesday. And we'll see how the Hawks bounce back. With all that said, we'll get out of here now. But I want to remind you again, and there'll be some extra content in the audio-only feeds of this podcast. If you're a subscriber on Apple or Spotify, you will see some extra content from the folks at the network and Locked on Sports Atlanta. In fact, I think the show for tonight's already been posted. So check that out in the audio feeds. Just some extra bonus content. Nothing less for me ever, but uh, it's just one of those things. You can get some extra stuff from the network in that feed. On the video side, though, just be me and my shining face and my, whatever guest I might have. But anyway, I encourage you to, to subscribe to the podcast anywhere you get your podcast, places like Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, Overcast on the audio side, and then also again on YouTube on the video side. I would love it if you liked the show and subscribed to the podcast and shared it and all that fun stuff in real time. And we're doing some premiere stuff when the show goes live and all that fun stuff as well. So please check us out all those places and subscribe and tell a friend about the podcast. Also follow us on Twitter slash X at Locked on Hawks for the show, and at BT Roland for myself. I also wrote about the Hawks as well. Patreon.com slash BT Roland. That is Patreon.com slash BT Roland. With all that said, enjoy the rest of your evening and your Wednesday. I'll be back after the game on Wednesday evening from State Farm Arena, and fun should be had by all. We'll see you all next time.